Uh, I, like most people I know, am a paradox. I have a healthy suspicion of authority, whether it's governmental, religious, or even more personal. However, I am also a careful rule follower in many instances, especially when it comes to recipes. I am not the one who puts in a dash of this or a dab of that. I measure out the ingredients as the recipe suggests. And I know that whoever wrote this recipe has already saved me the trial and error in the instructions. And they, whatever I make, if I follow them, it will yield the dish I expect and taste like it's supposed to. That being said, there are some recipes that I have made over and over again, and I no longer need the recipe to complete them, or I may just use it as a reference. And then I just put in the uh, number and amount of spices and enhancements I want for my taste even if it goes against what the original recipe had called for. Because you know what? We are all rebels in some way. <laughs> and we are all rule followers in some ways. The difference becomes whose rules and regulations we're following and whose rules and regulations we are disregarding. There's been a lot of talk recently in this nation about insurrection and revolution. And what seems to be misguided to some appears to be a path worth pursuing for others. We are all rebels. We are all rule followers. Martin Luther King Jr., that famous rebel, taught that none of us need to follow in unjust laws. But there are some, though, who saw those laws as just and wanted to force everyone to follow them. King, though, he knew the power of being both a rebel and a rule follower. He led a nonviolent rebellion against injustice, but he followed the rules of the nation to get civil rights laws and voting right laws passed. So my question to you this morning, Jubilance, is where are you rebelling and where are you rule following in your life? The example of the greats, Jesus, Buddha, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, they give us clues about which rules to follow and which to rebel against. Do the rules bring life? Do the rules bring love? Or do they bring death or fear? Now, I don't know about any of you, but every year, as the holidays begin to approach, I am filled with a sense of anxiety and dread. And it's not that I hate the holidays. I really don't. They're, they're not a source of depression or despair for me, as they are, unfortunately, for, for a lot of folks. But no, I dread the holidays for one reason and one reason only, and that is because it upsets my routine. <laughs> I am not, I am, if nothing, a creature of habit. That's why my dogs and I get along so well. Oh, it's 9 o'clock. It's time for a walk. <laughs> I like days that are planned out. I like days that have no surprises. Spontaneity and I have not been on speaking terms for a long, <laughs> long, long time. I am not the one you call up when you get a hankering to just go and take a drive somewhere at the last minute because I'm going to need to know some detailed plans ahead of time so I can rearrange my schedule, psych myself up for the inevitability that something out of the ordinary is going to be happening, and then maybe, maybe we can work something out. <laughs> and I don't think I'm alone in this affliction. The addiction to routine, the desire to control our time and the events in our lives, I think that's probably a universal thing. Even the most spontaneous among us can often enjoy the comforting grind of boredom every now and then. I mean, we all need a break, right? From whatever we're doing. Deb does not need a break. Okay. We humans, though, we often take that craving for routine and control to the extremes. And this is what Jesus is trying to point out constantly to the scribes and the Pharisees with which he so often did mental and theological battle during his ministry. Now, Jesus took every opportunity to challenge them on how they practice their faith. And don't get me wrong here, Jesus is not telling his opponents that Judaism itself had gotten it wrong or that its systems were not life-giving under the right circumstances. Jesus was an observant Jew, after all. He knew the innate holy power of the religion itself. But what he's saying to these scribes and Pharisees is that they had become addicted to a domesticated version of their own dynamic and transformational faith. Instead of allowing that life-giving, chaotic spirit to disrupt their lives and bring them the freedom that they really craved, they had fossilized their religion. They had 
made it just into a set of moral codes and rules and regulations that demoralized anyone who really tried to follow it. Of course, the Pharisees weren't following it. They just expected everybody else to. And that's why Jesus called them on it. And Jesus invites them to do, and invites us every day to do, to step out of the artificial calm that we have tried to create in our religious systems and allow the Holy Spirit to sweep us away into some divine spontaneity that can move us out beyond our stale rules for living. Be rebels is what he was trying to tell the Pharisees then and us today. Be willing, be willing to let the Spirit move and create some holy chaos to help you rebel against the darkness that you may be feeling. So how do you do that? Well, in the scene from today's Jesus story, he did it by changing just one word in their traditional scriptures in an effort to try to shed some light and shake them free of their spirit Spirit-sucking complacency. I'm thinking that's a good band name. Like Spirit-sucking okay. complacency. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, spirit-sucking complacency. Yay! <laughs> it is. <laughs> and they asked Jesus in this, in this scene, what's the greatest commandment? Mainly because they believe that the law is the only thing that's going to bring order and and light to their lives. And so Jesus answers them with a, a passage that I'm sure they all knew by heart, Deuteronomy 6, 5. But he adds a twist that offers them enlightenment if they have the ears to hear it. The original scripture from Deuteronomy reads, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might or your strength. But when Jesus says it, it's different. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He replaces the Hebrew word me'od. Everybody, here's your Hebrew lesson. Me'od. With the Greek word dianoia. Dianoia. <laughs> yeah, dianoying. Don't be dianoying. Anyway. So the Hebrew word me'od means force or strength. But the Greek word that Jesus used means understanding or imagination. What Jesus is trying to do here is work a miracle on these Pharisees by bringing their darkness to the light and giving them this new perspective about the Holy Spirit and how it works. He was trying to show them that by relying on our strength to love the holy replacing that responsibility squarely with our ego, that fickle, capricious side of us that craves order and wants the whole world to be predictable and void of any chaos. And we think this way every time we start a new diet. It's going to be our strength. It's our willpower. It's going to keep all the cookies and chips and ice cream out of the house, and then we go to the grocery store. Well, how's that working out for you? They jump in. <laughs> they, jump in. They, just, right, they just make their way into the... How did that get there? No, Jesus says, egoic strength is not enough. We have to let go of our love of control, and instead we have to love the holy with our mind, with that higher divine self that we all have. We can't love God from the ego any more than we can truly love ourselves or others from this needy, greedy, controlling place. Love can only come from that source of holy chaos, from the Holy Spirit that demands that we give up our comfortable routines and beliefs along with any notion that we can control how the Spirit moves in, through, and around us in this world and in our lives. So by daring to change just one word in the Hebrew Scriptures, Jesus introduced a little bit of holy chaos into the world of the Pharisees and the scribes by daring to be a rebel. He inspires his followers to do the same, which looked a lot like revolution to the Pharisees. And it was the Pharisees' addiction to order and control that ultimately got <laughs> Jesus killed. But don't we try to quash and kill the very same spirit of holy chaos that seeks to shake us from our own particular form of complacency and bring us from the darkness to the light? The ego convinces us that we can find the true meaning of love out here in this bodily world. And not only that, we can capture it. 
We can harness it. We can control it. We can bring love into our lives by force. We can bring love into our lives by law, by fear and threats, the ego tells us. And we see this both in our political and religious leadership right now, who each in their own way promise, to, uh, promise us love in the form of wealth or security if we'll only follow the dictates of the law, be it civil or religious. We've seen how that works out. It divides us. These laws of love that the ego has, it divides us up into us and them, the have and the have-nots, the saint, the sinner. This is what human law does. It makes us either lawbreakers or law abiders. It marginalizes some and privileges others. A Course in Miracles reminds us, no law the world obeys can help you grasp love's meaning. What the world believes was made to hide love's meaning, it says, and to keep it dark and secret. There is not one principle the world upholds but violates the truth of what love is and what you are as well. This is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. As long as you try to domesticate love and put laws around who is lovable and who is not, you're never going to understand what love really means. Love is not orderly. Love cannot be controlled. Love is chaotic. Love is free. It, it is a rebellious spirit that goes where it will and sees everyone and everything as beautiful, as worthy, as innocent. Remember that time you first fell in love with somebody? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Deb. Because when you fall in love, you, in, you are just enraptured in that freewheeling, chaotic feeling. The whole world is suddenly beautiful. You smile madly at strangers. You dance with children. You feel like you're about a foot or so off the ground. There is no law that we can concoct that can create that feeling for any of us. This is the feeling of holy chaos when it blows through, when someone has become the focus of our affection. There is no love but God's, the Course says. And this is the chaotic, rebellious kind of love that doesn't make any distinction between sinner and saint, between the respectable and the recalcitrant, or even between Democrat or Republican. This love flows without regard to race or color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual identity, any other category we humans can think up to put ourselves and others in little boxes. Holy love jubilance is chaotic. It goes where it will, and it leaves no thing or no person untouched in its wake. And this kind of love, it doesn't change with circumstances. This kind of love can't be legislated or codified. It can't be tamed or domesticated or put in a box or even on a bumper sticker. Because this love is wild and free and fierce. It's the love of the rebel who has the eyes that see and the ears that hear Love's voice, the Course says. This is the love of the rebel who loves self, God, and neighbor, not with their ego's strength, but with the holy desire and imagination that created their mind. Breathe deep. Oh, but we still want to know the rules. So how do we get this kind of love? What are the steps you got to follow to let that kind of love flow through you? Is there a manual? Maybe a self-help book? Five steps to achieving unbridled love. Honestly. I mean, we haven't progressed much as a species beyond those ancient Hebrews. Moses had to deal with the same questions that we're dealing with today among his own people. They wanted some rules. They wanted a method, a system for loving God, for loving themselves and their neighbor. And they honored their laws. They sought to follow them. But often, even as we do today, we take those rules and regulations and we calcify them to the point that they become confining instead of liberating. So Jesus told the Pharisees, and us by extension, that we get it wrong whenever we follow the letter of the law and we forget the spirit. The spirit of the law, that chaotic Holy Spirit, is there to set us free, to unbind us from our routines and our rules that keep us stuck firmly in our ego. But first, first, okay, here's step one. There is one step. <laughs> you got to be a rebel. You got to get out of your dark, confining comfort zone of routine and step into that freeing light of the Holy Spirit. 
We have to be willing to have our lives disrupted. And I know, in the past year and a half, it's been nothing but disruption. <laughs> and we keep trying to get back to our routine, don't we? What if we just let go and enjoyed the disruption? To be uncomfortable. What if we're willing to have our idea of what love is, to be stretched in all directions, to be challenged by those we'd rather hate, to be taught to us by those we would rather ignore. We have to be willing to open the door of the ego and let the winds of the Holy Spirit just blow through and smash up all the beliefs and rules we have set up as sacred cows in our lives. We have to be willing to allow ourselves to be blown away by the chaotic love of God. It's out there blowing. It's out there blowing us all away this past year and a half or so. Remember the Course says there is no love but God's. We can't survive on the junk food love of the ego. And right now the Holy Spirit is blowing all that away. Because we build our lives on sand whenever we seek to love anyone from our own strength or our own will. Because that's not really love after all. It's simply something we try to command ourselves to do because you know we ought to love everybody. <laughs> I should do that. But jubilance, if the ego could concoct a law that would make everybody love everybody else equally, there would be no need for the Holy Spirit. But by our own strength, I think we've proven quite clearly we can't do much of anything. Not anything right, anyway. Moses told his followers to stop searching for the human law of love. There is no such thing, he says. It's not anywhere outside of ourselves. It's not in heaven. It's not out in the sea. We don't have to send anybody out to fetch this holy law for us. And the Course echoes those ancient words when it says, seek not within the world to find yourself, your capital S self, because all you find out there is your little s self. And it's not doing so well. It's just mucking things up. Love, the Course says, is not found in darkness and in death. And that's what our ego loves. So where can we find the law of love? Moses has the answer. He says the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart for you to observe. Jubilance, there is a holy fount of love within each of us. And it's not a lazy river that moves along calmly on the banks of our heart. No, this is a wild and raging rapids, and it overflows its banks as it seeks to douse every living thing on this planet with its chaotic and drenching love. And we can only channel that kind of a raging river of love by embracing the rebellious, chaotic, and life-giving higher divine self within us all. And we do that by refusing to be held to the world's laws about love, who should control it, and especially who should be receiving it. Jubilance, I remind you of two things. Only God's love. There is no law, there is no love but God's. And the word is very near you. That love is within you. And it is that word. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. So stop following the worldly rules of love and instead touch the rebel in you. And you will bring out all of the love in us. Then we all get to say, Oh, yeah.